Welcome friends on this second day of our three day event in New Delhi, India. I am very happy to see you all again today. Yesterday, I mentioned to you that only those people, those seekers who feel that they have had enough of this life in this physical world are ready to go back to their true home. If somebody feels that I am having a good time here, then they should continue to have their good time. Their time to go to their true home has not come yet. We all have a fixed time when we are ready to go back home. At that time, we feel we have had enough of this physical experience. At that time, we don't want to be here anymore. And that is why we are ready to go back to our true home. I mentioned to you yesterday that when we are ready to go back home, a perfect living master automatically appears in our life. This was prearranged before we ever left our true home. That time is the time when we can say we are ready to go back to our true home. The perfect living master is nothing different from any one of us. He is a human being like all of us. There is no difference whatsoever in the anatomy and body of a per perfect living master. His perfection does not consist of physical body. His perfection consists of the fact that while he is here with us, his attention, his consciousness, his awareness is at all levels of experience, all levels of consciousness, including our true home. That means such a person, when he sits amongst us, he speaks from our true home. And therefore, he is aware at all times of our route, route to go back to our true home. He is aware physically and personally, at the very time when he is a human being, he is also aware of our true home. He can be at all levels of existence at the same time. It does not mean only a perfect living master can do that. All of us can do that. The capacity to be at all levels of experience exists in all of us. In fact, if you go to your true home, you will be at all levels of experiences. The true home is not disconnected from where we are now. What we are experiencing now is also within our true home. What the astral plane is, is also within our true home. The causal plane is also within our true home. The spiritual region called Parabrahm is also within our true home. Such Khand is also within our true home. They are all within the same one. The truth is, there is only one. Whatever name you want to give it, it doesn't matter. There is only one totality of consciousness in which all the show, all the drama has taken place and created these different levels of consciousness. We have never been separated from our true home. We have lost the awareness of it. The spiritual journey that I am sharing with you or speaking about is to regain that awareness. It is not going somewhere. It is not a journey in the sense of traveling somewhere. It's a journey of becoming aware of our own true home, which is already with us. We cannot be outside of this. Supposing we step out of our true home, it won't be our true home anymore because our true home is perfect and complete. And nothing exists outside of it. All this existence that we have created is the existence within that. The only thing that we have lost is awareness of the full capacity of our own true home and we are seeing a very small section of it which we call our physical existence. Physical existence is just a temporary existence. Nobody has been in physical existence forever. We come in physical bodies 
and that is what makes physical existence. If we did not have a physical body, there would be no physical existence. The physical existence comes into being when we are in a physical body. The moment we leave the physical body and take on another form, the existence takes on that form also. This world we see outside is made of matter, is made of atoms and molecules. The scientists tell us that this is all a hollow universe consisting 99.9999% of space. In fact, some are not even sure something, it is probably 100% space. Space means, as we know it, hollowness. Space means anything can be placed into it. And we have placed matter into space. The energy that exists in space becomes matter. This world we are living in is an existence in space and time and is created because the energy, the consciousness, the ability to be aware has been made into matter. And that is why we have a physical existence. The moment we die in the physical body, we transform ourselves into a different form. And that form is not physical. It has no molecules. It has no atoms. It has nothing physical. And yet it is existence. It is an existence depending solely upon our capacity to have the five senses and the sensory experience, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to touch, smell, the ability to have all these five sense perceptions continues to exist. So the existence is still there because we are having the experience with the five senses with no matter whatsoever. That is why our form, which sometimes we say sukshyam shri or fine body or astral body, is nothing more than the capacity of consciousness to function with the sense perceptions without having any matter. That is why that form of ours has no weight, it has no gravity, it does not function in the physical form at all. That is why in that form it is so easy to fly about in the existence that is created because of our being in that state. We create a world around ourselves, we create an existence around ourselves depending upon what awareness we have. Physical awareness reduces us to a physical world of matter. Astral sensory experiences bring about a sensory world which we can only experience with our senses. And therefore, it's also existence with senses alone. But we can go beyond that, leave that sensory body also. In fact, we all do it. Just like this physical body has a very limited time. We do not stay in this body for more than 100 years, 80 years, 120 years. Yesterday, I was reading an article last night that they said there is no capacity for us in physical terms to live even beyond 125 years. Previously, they thought that with transplant of organs, we can keep on living for millions of years. We keep on transforming all the organs of the body and it is easy now to find transplanted organs or we can find machine, mechanical organs that can make us live longer. Yesterday, the scientists have said, no, the capacity for existence does not allow us to go beyond 125 years of physical life. All the point I'm making is this very short period. We're thinking of thousands of years, thinking of millions of years. We find fossils where we find dinosaurs and the carbon dating system says they existed 80 million years ago. They lived 130 million years ago. And they say that there was somebody like us who saw them which means that we have existed for millions of years. And how much is our life here? Very, very small. We are, if there was a clock, and the clock said we have started at 12 o'clock, and now we are at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, how much is life? Not even two seconds. That is our life. Some mystics have explained our life is just like a bubble. You see, the bubble is formed in, in the water, 
with the little so salt in it and shines in the sky and looks beautiful it has rainbow color in it and it's the existence of the bubble in a moment it goes away it's finished the bubble is only created by air getting filled into it when it breaks down here is back in the total air we are in the same state there is no difference we have very short experiences in different forms of existence even in the sensory form even when we can see touch taste smell but have no body even that stage is limited and most of these experience people tell us that that state is also no more than 1000 to 3000 physical years that means that also dies the inner body also dies many people mistakenly think that is our soul that is not our soul our soul is the capacity to be aware our soul is consciousness these forms no matter what form it is is created out of different levels of consciousness and when the astral form or the sukshma sharir the fine body dissolves and goes away we are left with another body which is very interesting that's probably the most interesting body that we still wear upon our soul upon our consciousness and that is called the causal self the causal body or the mind the human mind is the causal body there is no separate body the one with which we think today is the mind and the mind is our causal body which means that even after we leave our physical body even after we leave our astral body we still have another body which is the same thing which is continuously thinking in us today the thinking machine which which analyzes things which breaks things to understand things as i was mentioning yesterday that is our mind and the mind is our causal body the mind functions also in limited time the mind is also not unlimited according to these experience people who go beyond the mind and study what is the nature of the mind which of course we all can do don't think that these are special people who can have access to these things all human beings have the same capacity to reach any level of consciousness and experience any of these realities that i'm talking about when we have that experience we discover our human mind which thinks which rationalizes which uses logic which makes sense to us which makes sense perceptions understandable to us which makes our physical world understandable to us that mind is also a body has a limited time according to these experts it lasts in physical years 1 million to 3 million years the cosmic time is much more than that even here cosmic time created for experience is far more than these terms even the mind dies mind has a limited time the only thing in us which never dies and is immortal was never born will never die is our own soul our atma our unit of consciousness with no body upon it at all and that consciousness exists per se by itself and it does not require a body it assumes these bodies for the sake of having different types of experience without these bodies it lies in a state of bliss it lies in a state of total knowing total knowledge it lies in a state of being total love the love bliss and this amazing amazing things that it can do through intuitive knowledge through the state of blissful thing and the state of love that it encompasses love is a, the greatest feature of that consciousness of power which we call the soul it's amazing that when the soul is only one which is the ultimate truth there are no two there is only one if we realize this fact that there is only one and everything that we are seeing the many we are seeing here the many we see in the astral plane 
the many we see in the causal plane, many more we see in the causal plane, and still many more we see in our true home as souls, they are all part of one. The one become the many. Why should the one become the many? Because of its very nature. Its very nature contains love. It is part of love. It's made up of love. Our consciousness, our ability to be aware is no different from love. It's no different from total knowing, total knowledge. It's no different from total bliss. We talk of Anand. Anand, we use the word for that state. It means total bliss of which there is no opposite. Bliss is not happiness. Happiness comes when we have unhappiness. It's an experience of opposites. Bliss is not as no opposite. Our own total self to experience these three things just for the sake of experiencing within itself. These things, the bliss, the total knowledge and the power of love. It develops the many within itself and those things become an experience within itself. I was mentioning to you how people were telling me when I was young that we are coming from an ocean of bliss, a big sea, big ocean, full of love, full of knowledge, full of everything. Nothing was outside of it. And somehow we slipped out as little drops and missed our ocean and we went away somewhere into different worlds, including this physical world. We have been separated from our ocean and one day we have to go back and merge in that ocean. And I mentioned to you that how horrib horrified I was when I was told this is the spiritual path. We are drops of ocean, of consciousness separated from our ocean. One day we have to travel all the way, make a spiritual journey to reach that ocean and get merged in it. I thought I was young, but I had this thought. I said, how can we call it a progressive spiritual path, which leads to the destruction of your identity of a drop and takes you into a merger with something that does not need any drops anymore. How much difference will it make to an ocean to add one drop to it? It makes no use to the ocean. And what happens to us? We lose everything. When we were a drop, the sun was shining. We had rainbows on it. We enjoyed ourselves. We had a human body. We had a, a sensory body. We had a mind. We had an identity. And spiritual path means go and destroying all this and merging in something that doesn't need us. Is not benefiting by going back to it. So I was thinking the spiritual path that is being explained to us is a lose-lose situation. We don't gain anything, we lose our own identity, we lose everything. But I was wrong. The whole concept of saying we are a drop of the ocean separated trying to go back is wrong. Because if the ocean is total and perfect, there can be no drop going out of it. If one drop has left the ocean, it becomes imperfect. The very definition of our totality, of our creative power, is it's perfect, which means nothing has gone out of it. Everything is still in it. Then I realized the truth was a little different. The truth was we were little drops of the ocean, but we were still in the ocean. We never left it. What we left was an awareness, a knowledge that we were the ocean. What was the spiritual journey was not a journey of traveling somewhere. The spiritual journey was to regain our consciousness that we are the ocean. I am mentioning to you right now that we let us understand that the spiritual journey is not going anywhere. What you have to find is already with you. Where you have to go, you are already there. You are in your destination. You have to find the awareness of it. It is not difficult to find the awareness if you just see 
what the principle of finding awareness is. Then it becomes easy and simple. The principle is that our self, which I said yesterday, never changes. The self never changes. Everything else changes. All experiences change. Our forms change. All forms change. They are born, they die. The whole universe dies. Galaxies are being formed and being destroyed. Every experience dies. Self that is experiencing all that does not die. The self remains the same no matter what your form is. I mentioned the example yesterday of the Chinese philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly. And people told him, you cannot be a butterfly because butterfly's body is different. You should not say you were a butterfly. You should tell people, I had a dream in which I saw a butterfly. But the philosopher said, I never saw a butterfly. I was seeing flowers. I was seeing, I was flapping my wings. I not even saw, saw my eyes. Because nobody can ever see their eyes. No matter what form. Whether you are physical, astral, causal, you never see your eyes and yet you see with the eyes. You can take a mirror and see a reflection of your face and eyes, but you cannot see the eyes, your own eyes which you are seeing. Because they are so located in every form of yours, that from within you see outside. So the, he could not say that he saw a butterfly because he was seeing with the eyes of a butterfly and yet he knew he was the same philosopher who when he woke up with the same self, the self never changes. Even when we go to our true home and discover we are an Atma, a soul, it will be the same self. Even when we become one with the totality, it will be the same self. Self has never changed. Everything else changes. So we can observe different levels of existence and consciousness, but we do not become the form. Now, here is the catch, the only catch, that we, instead of knowing who the self is, begin to take the form we have as our self. Here we have a physical body, so we think this is the self. We regard the physical body as our own self. A name is given to this physical body and we continuously respond to that name as if the self is responding to that name. That is not our name. That's the name of the physical body, not of the self. When we die, leave the physical body behind for cremation or burial, we have a different name. And yet that is not our name. That's the name of our sensory system. When the sensory system dies, then we or the mind and soul put together, held together to experience thought, space, time, creativity. And we have still a form. And yet the name we give to that form is not our name. It's the name of the form. When we go become a soul, an individuated Atma, and we say, this is my Atma, this is so-and-so Atma, that's not correct either. It's just the name of the Atma, which is only a cover upon a totality. When we become one total, we have no name. So there is no name of the self. We are giving names of the forms it takes. And we begin to identify with that. That is the only problem that is stopping us from becoming knowledgeable about the self. That we identify ourselves with the form in which we are sitting. And now, what is happening? We are sitting in a physical body. We have children. They are my children. They are not your children. Your body's children. This is my house. That's not your house. That's your body's house. Everything that you are saying, my, I, they belong to me. They don't belong to you at all. They belong to your body. If they belong to you, you should be able to carry them with you. When you die, nothing goes with you. It stays with the body. Physical things, objects, people, 
all physical experience stays only with the physical body. When you leave it, it's all left behind. It's not yours. Even the astral self, all the sensory experiences you have, heavens, hells, all those experiences of different kinds, flying into skies, are not yours. They just belong to your form. When you leave that form, leave everything behind. We are making a big mistake of misidentifying ourselves with the form in which we are experiencing our existence. If we just get off that mistake, that blunder, there will be no difficulty in going to our true home and to find who we really are. When we say that this is myself, when we die, we know it or not. Too late. You can't do anything at that time. You are dead. The physical body is gone. Too late to say, I was not the physical body. All your life you spent saying, I am the self, I am the body. But can we do that earlier? I mentioned we can. We can die while living in the physical body. Then we can know, even while we are living in the body. This was only my body, only my cover. I was living in it. And before I die, I can know that this body was not never mine. That's the first step of meditation or discovering of them. But you can go further while still in this physical body. You can then meditate with the inner body and become unaware of it and discover you were never the inner body either. And you are doing that still having the inner body and the physical body sitting here. You can go further. Some people have gone further. They've gone beyond the universal mind, which creates all the three worlds. They can go beyond that and find out even the mind was not ourself. We leave it behind. We don't have to wait for a million years for the mind to die, to find out who we are. We can go beyond the mind while we are still sitting in the mind, in the astral self, in the physical body. This ability to go beyond all these and discover our own true self first as the soul, as Atma, and then as totality that we are the Paramatma also. Atma is merely one unit of Paramatma living inside Paramatma. This discovery can be made while we are still sitting in a physical body. How is that possible? It has become possible because this body, physical body, is the most beautiful thing ever created. It's the most wonderful thing in the whole of creation, including the hells and heavens. The physical human body is the most wonderful thing because it contains within itself the places, the units, the centers where you can have these experiences. This body is divided into two parts. The eyes of the body divide it. There's the rest of the body below the eyes and there's a small section of the body above the eyes. This section below the eyes controls all our physical life. It controls all the energies that we expect. It contains all the circuitry of energy that establishes our experience outside and inside. It runs our life. These are six established centers of energy. All energy exists in these six centers. Above that, there is no center of energy. They are only centers of awareness, centers of knowing. The centers of awareness open up only in a small section of the head. And those centers are already located inside the physical body. The physical body contains within itself, embedded in this body, the body of sense perception. It contains within itself, in the small part, the brain and the mind. It contains within itself a journey from behind the eyes, backward and forward, right the centers which can give us a glimpse 
even of our atma and even of our paramatma even of our true home this is unique in this physical body i remember i might have mentioned to some of you about an experience that my master and some of us had when we went to on a vacation to karachi in now in pakistan where my uncle who was a meteorologist a weatherman used to work his house was a beautiful house on the clifton beach and he invited my master hazur maharaj baba saban singh ji he said please come and have a little vacation with us i have a nice home on the beach of the sea it's very beautiful and great master accepted that invitation now my uncle and my auntie there who lived there in karachi used to go to a swami swami brahmanand ji who used to teach yoga he taught the yoga of the awakening of the kundalini and about the six centers of energy he also was a good vaid practicing ayurvedic medicine my uncle and auntie used to follow the method of meditation taught by great master but they used to go to swami ji to get some ayurvedic medicines ayurvedic herbs and so on. the swami was very beautiful man he had a round face beautiful eyes he used to wear a small saffron colored orange colored turban and nice beautiful saffron colored uniform and he used to have a muffler around his neck which he used to hold with his hands and he had a big personality because of that and they loved that swami ji when they found the great master has accepted the invitation to come to karachi they went to swami ji and said swami ji our guru our sat guru from punjab is coming here we would like you to have his darshan also and swami ji said yes bring him to me i will give him my blessings now this is not what they were expecting so they decided to find a common ground and they decided to invite swami ji to a lunch in their house where great master was also living there so on the appointed day at the lunch they had a small sofa like a love seat with two seats on it they said we will seat swami ji and seat our master on the same sofa they can meet each other so on the day appointed at lunch time swami ji came to their house and he was seated on that love seat then they went to great master who was in the bedroom and he said come swami ji has come so great master came with his white beard and the kind of picture you see here and he also sat next to the swami ji my uncle stood in front and said master this is the swami ji i have mentioned to you from whom we get our ayurvedic medicines great master folded his hands bowed and said namaskar swami ji swami ji raised his hand and said i bless you we were watching that scene we expected something different but we said our master has got blessings from swami ji this was a little strange experience for us but after a few minutes great master said swami ji is it it a pity that so many holy people so many swamis so many yogis they are all caught up in the six centers below the eyes and nobody is having any knowledge of the 12 centers above and they don't know about the 18 centers that exist in this physical body swami ji looked at him and he said master i have never heard of those 18 centers can you please explain in more detail where those 18 centers are i have only heard of the six centers at the most i've heard there may be a seventh one at the top of the head but i have never heard these 18 centers where are they great master said swami ji this is a very long subject and if you care to come to my dera in punjab i'll be very happy to explain them to you 
the conversation ended there and there was lunch next day swami ji told my uncle i could not sleep all night i was going on trying to guess where these 18 centers are i have never heard of them there upon they said great master promised to explain them to you if you come to the dera he is on a short visit here great master and we all came back to the dera swami brahmanand ji announced to his congregation in his ashram i am closing the ashram i am going to a river bias there is a bearded man sitting there he came here he told me there are 18 chakras 18 centers in the body i want to go and find out where are those 18 centers so this ashram is closed if you want to come you can come with me to find out but i am not going to come back till i find those 18 centers swami brahmanand came to the dera great master ordered all his sevadars please give him the most favored vvip treatment he should be housed in the best guest house in the dera he should be provided the best food we have in the langar he should have attendants taking care of him and when i give my discourse my satsang swami ji will sit next to me this was a really vvip treatment swami ji liked it very much and he used to walk even greater pride and great master said if he wants to meet me he can meet me 24/7 day or night so swami ji one day said is it real that what he said so at 12 o'clock at night he went up to the house of great master and all the attendants were already told to open the door they opened the door welcome swami ji and they went and woke up the great master who was sleeping and there swami ji went up great master said swami ji what can i do for you he said just came to have your darshan at any time you said i can have your darshan i have come now he said most welcome you can come any time you like swami ji felt very happy that i have been given extraordinary place here in this dera then he attended the master's discourse master was sitting there was a chanter who was reading from books on the left side and swami ji sat on his right side master gave a discourse he says all these yogis and yogeshwars are all caught up in this six center have no knowledge what is the real truth these are energy centers not centers of knowledge or awareness that lies above they are working with energy not with knowledge and awareness and swami ji turn turn like this and he would lift was listening with great attention after one or two days he complained to great master he said master i am listening to you very carefully but i have to look at you when i'm listening and my neck is turned all the time like this i have got a pain in my neck the great master said i also noticed that so it's better you sit in front so from the pedestal with the great master he was placed in front with a special chair after few days he complained again he said master i have a little problem a great master said what is your problem swami ji what is your problem now he said my problem is that your stage is very high and i am sitting at the bottom in front i have to keep my head up all the time like that i got a pain in my neck again and great master said i also noticed that and he said move swami ji's chair 20 paces behind so he was moved to, to the some place not too far back but in the audience after few days swami ji said i have a little complaint master a little problem and great master said what is your problem now my problem is i sit on a chair people are sitting on the floor behind me and they can't see you they don't have darshan i feel very guilty instead of listening to you i am very worried about the people behind me great master said i also noticed that remove his chair and let him sit in the middle 
Swami ji sat in the middle. Now while this was going on, Swami ji was given a little small hut to keep on practicing his Ayurvedic medicine. In those days, I was also practicing homeopathic remedies. So great master had also given me a small hut where I had my homeopathic remedies and I was giving free treatment to whoever was coming there. So we were both next to each other. And I went to Swamiji once. I was sitting and we used to exchange information about remedies. And Swamiji said to me, your master is a very clever diplomat. I said, what makes you say that? He said, when I came here, he treated me like a VVIP. And I was put up in the best guest house. Now I sleep in my own kutiya in the dispensary in my Ayurvedic thing. He said, you can meet me anytime. Now I have to stand in line for his darshan also. He said, all the things were to boost my ego. He said so many things. And now he's taken all those away. And yet I can't go anywhere. He has trapped me with his love. His love is so powerful, I can't go anywhere. If he had treated me like I am being treated today, on day one, I would have gone back to Karachi. He knew what was my weakness. He knew that I like to be honored by who I am. I have discovered I am nobody. I have still to learn the basics of awareness of what he is talking. Anyway. Swami made a great progress in understanding that there are not only the six centers which are called Pinda centers, the physical centers, there are under centers behind the eyes. They go right to the middle of his head and they are specific points where you can draw your attention and have that experience. They are centers of Brahmanda and then they are centers of Sachkhand. But there are all those centers of awareness which he was not aware of. But when he practiced, he got initiated. He was given the method of meditating, starting from here, going up, not going down. It took him some time. He used to share this with me. He said, because I have been meditating all the time in the lower center, especially my heart center, Hirde Chakra, pulls me all the time. I try to remain here. But I am pulled down there because of my previous practice. And great master said, this is a matter of practice. You have to have practice in order to do anything. With practice, you will be able to hold your attention at the sixth center, the, the Ajna center, or the third eye center, or the Tisra Thil. You can center yourself there and start from there and not go down. Because Actually, the practice that Swamiji was doing, or which many yogis are doing, and I have also done, by the way, when I was testing out whether the great master teachings are the correct one or somebody else can give me better, I tested also. The method was simply to be in a wakeful state in which we are already behind the eyes. Our attention starts from the eyes in the wakeful state. Of course, when we go to sleep, it drops to the throat center when we have dreams which we can recall and to the heart center when we are not dreaming or dream that we can't remember. But in the wakeful state, we are already here. When we perform different kinds of yogas of energy, we actually drop our attention. We drop our attention not from the front, we drop our attention from the back. The spinal cord the spine behind is like an elevator in this body, which is like a house. And the front are like staircases. We drop ourselves to the bottom, to, this, to the Gudha Chakra, the rectum, where the, we sit on the body. And from there we use different mantras, depending upon what kind of colors of the environment we see, what kind of experience we have there, and step by step, stage by stage, we climb up the stairs to the next center, the Swadish center, this genitalia. We move to the Nabi center, the navel, 
we move to the heart, we move to the cunt, the cunt chakra, we move back and we make the circuit complete. That is really the, the basis of the yoga of the six centers. And all other experiences take place during that exercise. Different variations of yoga also take place the same way. Now, great master was saying, forget about all this. And don't let your attention go to these at all. Start from there, where you already are in the wakeful state. Why should you go down? These, these are two petal lotus. You call them the two eyes, the two petal lotus. You call the bottom the four petal lotus, then six, eight, sixteen petals, and then back to two. The same two petal lotus is also existing inside in the form of our imaginative eyes, which can imagine and see things, which does not involve the physical body. Those are also two petal lotus. And you can go behind also in the four petal lotus of a higher experience. And eight and sixteen and again back to the true knowledge, which is all existing inside this small portion of a physical body. These glimpses we can have of everything that exists, including our Atma and Paramatma, all built into this physical body. He took time to meditate. But the point was, why should we go below the wakeful state if we want to awake more into higher wakefulness? Why should it be necessary to go into trance-like situations, into samadhis and so on, in which we want to lose consciousness of our body and have consciousness of something which is an energetic form of the same body? I find people practicing in many countries an experience of what they call out-of-body experience, where they only project themselves from the heart chakra, heart center, and they feel they are out of body and yet connected with the body. They don't leave it completely. They go into a state where they can see their body as if they have moved their vision outside, which can be done by energetic practices. And they think they have found their soul. That is merely a reflection, energetic reflection of what you already have. You have much more than you get when you go out of the body like that. Great Master teaching does not require any of that. I did it out of curiosity. But the actual practice which makes us have higher awareness does not require any practice of yoga below the eyes. You can start from here and go above. Actually, his method says you should not start from anywhere except inside from the third eye center behind the eyes. I emphasized this yesterday and I am going to make you practice that today. Because as I said, my talking is no good if there is no walking behind it. My saying things has no value if there is no practice behind it. So today you want to practice. I also told you one very important thing about these teachings which I follow. There is no scope whatsoever for blind faith. You should never believe, even your Guru, till you have seen with your own eyes, till you have experienced yourself. And only believe what you have experienced. But do not disbelieve because somebody else has an experience. Don't say because I don't have it, it doesn't exist. You may find it later. Therefore, have this attitude. I don't want any blind faith. I want to believe firmly what I experience without doubt. There are some experiences we have with doubt. You can have a nice lucid dream and say, I had such a wonderful dream. I don't know if it is really a higher experience or just a dream that my mind made up. That's not a good experience. That's a doubtful experience. But if you have an experience on which you have no doubt, that's a good experience to believe in. And we have those experiences right now. Every one of us has at least two experiences which has no doubt whatsoever. First experience is that we exist. Nobody can deny that. You don't need proof from anybody. You don't need to pinch yourself to see if you exist or not. The very basis of consciousness is 
it makes you know that you exist no matter in what form fundamental point one you exist and this is certain that is certain knowledge another knowledge and that knowledge comes to us because we go to sleep every night we all go to sleep every night and we wake up in the morning we all wake up in the morning and we are certain we have woken up you never need any proof for that if supposing you go to sleep have a dream you are in a dream world seeing different things unaware of your body where it is sleeping where your bed is you totally lost contact you have gone out of your body into a dream body and then you wake up when you wake up nobody ever pinches himself to say i am awake nobody calls for proof tell me come and tell me i am awake or not you know you are awake not by opening your eyes not by moving your hands when you are awake you are lying in the same state in which you went to sleep and you know you are awake and that wakefulness is certainty nobody has ever questioned that if a thousand people came and told you when you wake up in the morning you are not awake you will not believe them but you believe your own experience that you are awake what makes that experience so certain and you are absolutely sure about it that you have no need to have any further proof what makes that experience certain is the fact that you are able to remember that you went to sleep you remember it's the same bed in the same place where i went to sleep the connection between your previous experience of wakefulness interrupted by a dream makes the experience of wakefulness completely certain it's the same kind of experience you must have to call it certain if you can awake to a higher level of consciousness and feel you have awoken to a place to an experience which you already were having before you had this body it is certain you will need nobody's proof for that and you can't prove to anybody else it's your own personal experience that is why i say in the practice of meditation that gives you higher awareness you must have experiences of certainty not of doubt and certainty comes when you link that experience with your prior experience in the same state don't forget we have not come here out of nothing we have come here out of our true home out of our totality of consciousness and we still have that with us we just forgot it by waking up we remember it and that makes certain that this was a certain definite experience and this applies to every level of wakefulness not necessarily to one or two or three right up to our totality of consciousness when we were wake to the state of parmatma we remember we were always there 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 was no doubt about it so that is why i say in this method of meditation you must only believe firmly believe what you are certain about and not what you are doubtful about this is basic to this experience one not necessary to go down into energy centers secondly not necessary to believe flimsy little experiences some people say we have been meditating very long and we can see some lights we see some colors we see some flashes here and there and we must be making great spiritual progress i said i can hit you on the head and you see the same things that's not going to be a spiritual experience spiritual experience is an experience of awakening to higher level of consciousness in which you were prior to you came to into physical body that's a true spiritual experience and that is possible while we are still here how is that possible because we can die while we are still living and have a simulated experience a copy experience of actual death while we are not dead that makes all the difference and how do we die while we are living we can watch people who die physically i have seen lots of people in my lifetime i have been grown old enough in this body to see many of my own friends dying some suddenly some slowly but whenever somebody has died 
and I can sit by his bedside in the hospital and watch him dying. I have seen he always dies in a certain way, in a certain stage. The awareness of his body and of the world disappears in stages. First, he can't remember anything outside, only his body. Then he can start forgetting where his feet are, where his hands are. Then he forgets where his arms and legs are. Then he begins to forget the bottom part of his torso, says, I am flying. I am going to, toward the room. He is not flying, he just lost the awareness of his bottom. Then he loses awareness as it comes up, gets choked up by the time in the heart stay. His eyes are still looking at you. And you can see he is conscious, talking to us. He com continues to die till the brain, the head dies and he is dead and the body has nothing left in it. It is a process of in which death takes place, withdrawal of consciousness, withdrawal of awareness of the body in stages, going from extremities all the way to the head. When the brain dies, you have left the body. There is nothing to do with the body. It is a piece of flesh. Now, we can do the same thing now without dying. We can do the same thing by withdrawing our attention. The three greatest gifts given to us as human beings, to perform these functions are the, the first of all the wakeful state in which you have awareness what's going on big gift that's how we're getting the experience second within that consciousness of what is existing which does not always include what your awareness now is you are conscious that there are other cities but you're not thinking of them now but you can recall them as you like they are part of your consciousness. But what you are looking here is part of that consciousness we call immediate awareness. We are aware we are all sitting in a hall. We are aware I am talking to you. This is awareness. Within awareness, we can narrow it down to a small part of awareness by putting attention only there. Supposing I say, here are some nice flowers lying next to me. Let's look at the flowers and you all start looking at the flowers. What are you doing? Flowers are a small part of the awareness of this whole building, of the whole hall. You start putting your attention on the flowers. And if I say, concentrate your attention on the flowers and you look at the flowers, the flowers alone be, will be seen by you. The longer you concentrate on the flowers, the rest of the awareness has no significance and disappear. This power of attention in awareness and the power to concentrate it where you like are the gifts given to us to discover everything. Instead of flowers, we can put the attention on ourselves, wherever we think it is. We know it's inside. Our self is inside operating, that's why we see with the eyes outside, we hear with the ears outside. It's inside. We can also, with a little, little, little contemplation, find out it is not in the rest of the body, it's just in the head, behind the eyes. What would happen if we place the same attention that we were placing on the flowers outside, if we place the same attention inside on our own self? We will be more aware of inside, less aware of outside. Supposing we concentrate our attention inside the same way, what will happen? We'll forget what is outside. We'll begin to forget the body which is around that self. And we'll begin to forget where our hands and feet are. We'll begin to forget where the legs and arms are. We'll begin to forget where the bottom of our body is. And we'll still be conscious of our head. As we move on more attention on the self, we'll even forget where the body is, where the head is. It's a process tested over and over again and works with every human being. Everybody can do it. And this step one in discovering, not discovering who yourself is, in discovering the body is not yourself. Step one, at least we know the body is not ourself, then what is ourself? the one that is trying to concentrate on itself behind the eyes. What is the capacity of that self inside our head?
to function. You will be delighted to know and surprised to know it can see more clearly than you see with his eyes. If these eyes need glasses to read, the inner eyes can read fine print without any glasses. You can test it out. It can hear better than the outside ears can hear. It can talk to itself better without using the tongue than the tongue can ever talk. It can touch better and feel the tactile sense better than our fingers and hands can do. It can walk better than our legs can take it. It can fly better, which means the body can't fly. Imagine the, imagine the nature of the inner self created by our imagination, created by putting our attention inside. With these two things, we can get that. Then what will happen next? We'll be able to fly. We'll be able to do other things. We can jump, we can dance with this body not moving at all. We can have those experiences with an inner self of ours. A self made only of sense perceptions and no molecules and no atoms and no physical form. We can do something much better after that. We can do the same process of going behind the eyes of the inner self and put our attention there. What will happen? If you put attention in that imaginary self of yours, which is doing all these things, and put the attention behind the eyes of that inner self, you will begin to withdraw your attention from all sense perceptions. You will lose all form. You will have no form, and yet you can think and talk to yourself. The mind will still be there. And your soul, which is making the mind alive, which is making this body alive, which is making the sensory system alive, will still be there. You'll be totally alive with this body breathing normally, heart beating no normally, and yet you are unaware of it. It's the unawareness that we have created by the tools we have been given of imagination, attention, concentration of attention. That's it. You can go even further to realize that you are a formless energy, formless, made of something that can resemble something outside, you will find you are made up of light and sound. Now that brings me to a very important point. When you find you are actually made up of light and sound and the capacity to think, that's your mind empowered by your soul, the light and sound being given by your soul. What about sound? What is the importance of sound? In all religious traditions, I found they give importance to sound. This is ring bells, or they ring a big bell. In Christian churches, in Hindu temples, I see little bells ringing, artis being performed with bells ringing. I see in Islamic culture, in the mosques, the Maulvi calling with a bang in the morning and with a loud way, a musical way, he's calling people to come. Every religion I've studied, 11 religions I studied when I was in a university in the United States, all of them have sound, external sound being made in order to perform the rituals and ceremonies of that religion. And we love music. I was walking outside, People were having plugs and doing like this. A new techno technology has given them music and they have had little, little things they have in themselves and they are hearing music and enjoying it. People are driving and the car is turned on to have music. Everybody loves music. People go to concerts, they enjoy it. Where is this enjoyment of music coming from? How has it become a great element of our taste? It is there because the best music is inside us, not outside. The best music can be heard inside us. And when, when can we hear the music? Music is merely sound. It can become beautiful when it goes into different tunes. It can become difficult, different and more, more attractive when it's a different kind of instrument. 
we have drums, we have bells, we have pipes. There are so many beautiful instruments producing music. And we produce religious music. When I came in here, we heard two songs right here, music. Everybody enjoying the music. I was enjoying it too. What is the secret of enjoyment of music or enjoyment of sound that has been made into music? The secret is that our Atma, our consciousness itself is a form of the highest music. It can't be called sound because sound requires air. It can't be called waves because waves require ether. Yet, it is music. It is audible. It can be heard. Now, I will tell you, how, what is the connection of music with our meditation technique? The connection is simple. I am speaking to you through words. They are sound. I'm starting the whole thing from sound. If I don't speak, you won't, I won't share anything with you. First step is a spoken sound, a spoken language, which we call Varan Atmak Shab. That means a sound that can be made into a language, sound that can be written down in, in script. And we start with that. Our first lesson we learn how to meditate comes with Varanatmak Shab or a spoken and written language. But that only lasts for some time. It only lasts when we understand what to do with our body, with our head, with our eyes, with our method of meditation. It ends there. Once you start meditating, this is finished. Not really. Varanatmak Shab ends and continues to be fine Varanatmak Shab, spoken Shab, which is of the nature in which our mind speaks without tongue. What are that speech called? Thoughts. We think in words also. And those are also words. They are spoken words. To meet that challenge of the thoughts, which take us out, because they are thoughts mostly of events happening outside. We use spoken words inside to squeeze those thoughts, words out, and that is called spoken mantra, simran, something else. That's also words. But we don't speak with the tongue. We speak with the mind to control the thoughts of the mind. Varanatmak has become finer Varanatmak now. After that, what happens if you stay there long enough? If you can hold your attention and concentrate it behind the eyes, what will happen? You will hear an internal sound, several internal sounds, which are not being created from outside. You can plug your ears completely. And you will still hear those sounds. Some sounds are very physical. If you are in such a state of height and hype of trying to see what is happening, you might even hear your heartbeat. You might even hear your breathing. A physical sound. You might even hear some sounds which are being created by the blood vessels going around your ears. Those are physical sounds. But they are not coming from outside into the ears. They are coming from within into the ears. Then you can hear sounds which are not even being heard by these ears at all. Nothing to do with the body. Those sounds are coming from your own self where you are trying to listen. And those sounds resemble the sounds we try to imitate in our temples and our churches. The sound of bell. The bell sound comes. It looks like little bells ringing somewhere and we can hear it. Just by being behind the eyes and concentrating our attention in the center at the third eye center. When that sound is heard, we don't need spoken sound anymore. And that Shabd, that sound has been called Dhunatmak Shabd. That means only the Dhun is there. The sound is there. We don't translate it into words and we don't translate it into writing. Therefore, we switch over from one sound to another. 
फ्रॉम वर्णात्मक शब्द टू फाइनल वर्णात्मक शब्द यू गोट धुनात्मक शब्द लिसन टू इट वॉट हैपन वेन वी लिसन टू इट इट इज कमिंग फ्रॉम विद इन आवर सेल्स इफ यू लिसन टू इट attentively you will forget your body it will pull you into the inner body faster than any amount of effort you can put by trying to be behind the eyes that is why this particular method of meditation has been called surt shabd yoga surt means attention shabd means sound yoga means union with your true self surt shabd yoga is practiced by listening to the inner dhunatmik song but that is not the end of it dhunatmik shabd can take you to a state faster you are almost like you are swept off your feet give that feeling when the big sound big sound of a bell can be heard by staying there it pulls you in faster but you can go beyond that if you withdraw from that sound to your inner self behind the eyes of the inner self the sound changes it is a continuous sound but you enter into the sound instead of beginning to hear the sound you get the experience that the sound has always been there and you were always with it it had never any beginning it did not start from the time you start listening to it other sounds only start when you listen to it that sound you enter it has no beginning and you feel that there is no beginning and therefore we give a different name to that sound we call it the anhad shabd anhad means it has no beginning no end it's only always there the anhad shabd you enter into it and it becomes a source of knowing your thoughts through that sound you get an awareness of your destinies you find out how pralabdh shabd pralabdh is made you find out what the say, various systems of karma are operating here that knowledge is given by a sound it's not sound sound is merely an expression of the self but that is not all you can go beyond that into a sound that has been called sar shabd sar means real which means you discover that there was no difference between light sound and yourself that's when you realize the atma to be pulled beyond that is not a effort that you can make because there is no mind to make effort there is no thoughts to try to make an effort how do you go beyond that to parmatma stage is only through the pull of something that is already there you are already there but not knowing it and you are being discovering yourself through another human being we are calling perfect living master who is showing us his love it's the same love that pulls you beyond atma into paramatma that path is not of effort it's a path of being pulled by love love that coming from beyond the mind where you will find you and the master are the same it was only an extension of yourself that you called a perfect living master as a human being there you discover it was merely an extension of your own consciousness great experience that love pulls you into totality and to your true home into such kind what happens when you experience that love you are so overwhelmed by it that you feel like doing anything to hold on that feeling of holding do anything to hold on is called devotion bhakti you become a bhakt when you are pulled by that love and love and devotion both become a reality for you i am explaining to you what all is possible within this little tiny head of ours in a human form is the greatest thing that can happen when we are ready for going to our true home all this happens you don't do it it just happens when you try to do it you get caught up here in the mind trying is very very small function of a mind to try to do something a friend of mine once wrote to me when i was still in the university 
he said i have discovered that this path does not require effort this path is totally effortless nice letter he wrote to me about effortlessness at the end he says i am now going to try very hard for effortless meditation that's how our mind works we can't get out of it we think we have to make an effort even to be effortless therefore we get caught up in the region of the mind therefore all attempts which people have made with their mind yogis yogeshwar who have reached the universal mind are caught up there because they think effort is giving them everything the pull of love is not effort when somebody loves you you don't make an effort you pulled by it love pulls you beyond that therefore don't forget that the final journey from the param atma to paramatma is only with love and devotion nothing else but it does not mean that you have to wait till you reach that stage to experience love you start from here that is why what is the role i am giving you nutshell experience what is the role of a human being like ourselves we call a perfect living master his role is merely to pull you with the love and take you back home. that is why all other things he says do meditation follow this diet follow these things follow 1 2 3 4 5 things in order to get there and there are five stages to go there 1 2 3 4 5 5 all this is for our mind there are no five stages there is no five words this is only for the mind mind loves classification mind loves if you put things into 1 2 3 4 5 you say that must be the truth is there no 1 2 3 4 5 it's too abstract it's not a, it's not real i remember something i took advantage of this fact i was in college in government college ludhiana i studied there for my master degree i mean english and there used to be elections for president of the students union and it was done by vote and there were many people who had a brilliant record first class first in ba bsc i had a third division in ba bsc so i was not really qualified compared to the others also they were better build one was very tall man looked like an athlete he was a candidate i put in my candidature also but i did one thing which they didn't do i prepared a list of 10 points that what a president of a student union should do he should organize this do this work for the students i made just 10 list of 10 things and i i was the last speaker in the debate i said what are these people talking about they have no agenda for the students i have 10 points and that given printed copy of the 10 point to three four people who sat at different locations among the students so i told them when i sp- speak of 10 points i raise my hand throw those papers out when the time came i said i have 10 points to work for you 1 2 3 4 i read them and they threw the papers i got overwhelming majority of the votes and became president of the union i was just taking advantage of a simple simple thing that the mind loves mind loves to break things into pieces and number them down it can also work otherwise i'll give you one more example personal this is during my personal life at one point in my service career in the government i was appointed as chairman of the dandakarni project dandakarni is the area the name has been given for during the banwas when ram was sent out he traveled around many places for 14 years those areas where he traveled which could, which today are part of uttar pradesh madhya pradesh odisha part of bengal that was the dandakarni area in which he walked partition was taking place and many people were refugees running from bangladesh the dandakarni project was set up to resettle them in the forest of madhya pradesh forest of odisha and make them habitable only tribals lived there 
before that. I got this posting and job as chairman of Dandakanya project. So I went there. I wanted to meet those tribal people who were resisting the coming of refugees. So I became very friendly to them by trying to say, I am a refugee also, I have come from Pakistan, things like that. But one night, I decided to go to the deepest part where no officer had ever gone. I said, let me go and see those people. They've never been helped with anything. So I took with me different heads of department of the government, took the chief engineer of irrigation, chief engineer of building, director of health services. I took people of different needs that people mostly have. And I went there and these people were waiting. I reached at night. They were interpreter, interpreting their language for me. And they had a list of 16 points that they wanted. The interpreter read them to me. They want a dispensary. They want a hospital. They want roads. Oh, normal. They want a canal system. They want water. 16 points. I heard them very closely. And at the end I said, what you are asking, I, you don't need me. He is a director of health services, give you the hospital. He is a chief engineer, he'll give you the roads and the irrigation system. All these head of departments are with me. They give you all these things. I haven't come for that. You know what I've come for. I told those tribal people and the refugees would come there. I have come for point number 17 and 18, which is not even in your list. And all of them, when the interpreter told them, nodded their head. I must confess today, I don't know what point 17 and 18 are. They were satisfied. This is the mind, human mind. Human mind loves classification, even if there's nothing in the classification, which was the case in my case. They knew there was something better than all those 16 in number 17 and 18. And they reacted to that. Our mind is like that. We proceed like that. Even in meditation, we go like that. One stage, now I've gone to the Suksham Shri, now I've gone to that Shri. As if they are living one above the other. Some people draw a diagram. They say, here are the six centers below the eyes and they make picture of the body. Then they want to draw the picture of the higher levels. They say, this is the astral stage, above that causal stage, then there is power from, then there is such kind, there is anami, they go on to go on, eight stages. Nice picture, people love it. They say, we will meditate, we see the picture. The picture is not true at all. There are no stages one above the other. The stages are within you, one after the other. You become unaware of one form of yours, the other one opens up. You become unaware of that, the third one opens up. You become unaware of that, the soul comes up. You become unaware of the soul, the Paramatma comes up. Where are the stages? But mind will not accept that. Mind will accept levels that we create, levels of consciousness, levels of creation. It's the nature of the mind. And that is why we go with the mind and open up, but the experience inside cannot be described. The experience of non-space and non-time has never been described by anybody. And yet we write books about it. Great master, own master, was Baba Jamal Singh. He was a disciple of Swamiji Seth Shivdyal Singh from Agra, who started the Radha Swami movement. He was his follower. Now when Swamiji of Agra used to describe the beauty of the inner stages, the beauty of our true home. He used to say, it's so beautiful. The trees there are several miles long, laden with rubies and diamonds. Most of his audience were women, you know, because of that. He talked of jewelry on very tall trees, occurring where, where there's no space, to grow a tree, with no place to have a jewel. But the satsang was very good and people followed meditation because of that. 
there is no description at all of anything that is outside of time and space and our truth is outside of time and space and yet we try to describe it for the mind not for the self the self makes its discovery by itself and the make a discovery is actually in fact a simple process of becoming unaware of your covers and you can do that with the help of the gifts given to us imagination awareness attention and the power to concentrate our attention this can lead you to everything that is why in this age kali yuga the surt shabd yoga of following the sound to create an unawareness of your forms and be aware of the inside so the sound comes from inside it varies because of what is worn by us as costume a very costume that is why i said if somebody is going to meditate in the true way of withdrawal of attention to your own self you should never meditate outside anywhere you should never have a room set aside for meditation you should never have a special chair for meditation never have a special carpet on which you sit to meditate because no matter how hard you will try your attention will remain on these things which you especially prepared for meditation people take me to their homes this is very our meditation chamber our temple in the house we meditate here and i go there and i see all they can meditate is on the temple on the little statues they have little bells they have kept there how can they go anywhere else how can that awareness go away when that's the beginning of their awareness you sit on a special chair you are meditating on the chair do not start any meditation unless you have gone at the starting point which is inside you not outside forget everything outside before you start meditation let's do it now you said i should do it with you i do it now these were little samplings so I have some sample of what you can get the longer you practice the better you will get in these last two sessions which were with the beloved how many of you felt i should not have counted five and you could continue like that i'm so happy that's beautiful that's the kind of meditation which you like to do people don't do meditation like that they think meditation is a chore we have to do it because of a duty we promised we will do meditation now we have to complete the time i told you the story of my friend in san francisco who, when i went there after a long trip from india i was tired but he said oh very happy ishwar your old satsangi old great masters follower we'll meditate together at 3 o'clock in the morning san francisco time and i had to keep my face and said all right he put the alarm we both woke up 3 o'clock sat together cross legged next to each other on the floor and i did i was not trying to meditate to tell you the truth i was trying to just close my eyes to keep him company and just to say that i am with you so that is why from time to time i would open my eye a little from the side and see what he is doing i don't know if it was a coincidence or what happened every time i opened my eye to see him he was doing like this he look at his watch it is so difficult to pass two and a half hours when you are enjoying nothing It's terrible. That is how we meditate. With great torture, difficulty, we completed two and a half hours. And he said to me, "Great, wonderful meditation we had today." I said, "Sure, we did. The only difference was we did not meditate on the third eye center. We meditated on your watch." 
you are looking constantly there to make two and a half hours. What good is a meditation when you are constantly bothered by how much time you have spent? Meditation in its success is not measured by the time you put to it, but the quality which you put into it. How concentrated your attention was behind the eyes counts. Five minutes of concentrated high quality meditation is better than eight hours of meditation mechanically. That is why it should be meditation you enjoy. I just saw the last two sessions, you were happy. You were smiling inside and outside. You were enjoying. That's the meditation you will enjoy automatically. You will say, I want to meditate 15 minutes, two hours will pass. You can try it out. But I will close this morning session, today's session, with answering some questions. And do you have some questions written up? The question will be read out first, given to me. I will read a second time to make sure what the question is, and then I'll try to give an answer. To Jesus, loving master, thank you for all your love and grace. Is there any possibility to translate all your satsangs in Hindi so that many more satsangs and people like me uh, can take advantage who cannot understand English so well? This is just a request. Rest all is good and please shower your grace and blessings to me and my family. Is that a question or an essay? Uh, uh, maybe long question, maybe more than one question, but I'll read it again. First is a statement, thanks for all your love and grace. Now come to the question. Is there any possibility to translate all your satsangs in Hindi so that many more Sangat and people like me can take it advantage who cannot understand English so well. This is just a request, rest all is good and please shower your grace and blessings on me and my family always. Thank you, love and regards. This is just a question, request is that I should be able to say the same things in Hindi also. I said the same things in Hindi only the other day. On the 6th, a recording was done of my talk in an ashram here in Hindi. It will also be put on YouTube and you can listen to it. It's already a translation of what I say. And I must tell you, I say the same thing every time. Words may be a little different. But I'm saying the same thing. Go within, truth is inside, and method is simple. That's all I say every day. I've been saying it for 50 years. For 60 years, I've been saying the same thing. No new thing. In fact, my wife stopped coming to my talks. She said, you are going to repeat the same thing. I've already heard it. So why should I come again? So the, the translation in Hindi will be available. Secondly, I gave a talk in Dubai in the 70s, it's also in Hindi. And recently they found it out and put it on YouTube. They have a second, second, uh, that's a better one. I'll tell you why I think that 1970 talk is better. Because somebody had a, it's an audio talk, no video. Somebody had that cassette. And I was driving and he put that cassette on in the car. It looked wonderful discourse to me. As I listened, I said, this must be a guy who knows something. I never thought it's my talk. I said, this is so beautiful. I wish I could take a copy of the tape for myself. Only at the end, when the speaker said, what I am saying is not mine, I am repeating like a parrot. I said, that's me. <laughs> then I discovered that the teachings are of my master. I was just repeating like a parrot, but I was a good parrot at that time. So I repeated very accurately. And therefore, I myself enjoyed the talk. 
till the end i said oh it was only mine so but that talk is available it also deals with meditation and the various levels that we can reach through meditation it's a good talk i liked it i liked it myself uh, but i know these two are known there are also some portions of talks i've given which are in punjabi and hindi so those are not all punjabi hindi but some in english some in punjabi you can get them i'll take up one more question for this session take up more tomorrow the question in hindi is ghar mein murti puja aarti havan ye sab ho rahe hain ye kya hai kya hum in sab ko band kar le my answer is no sab kuch chalao kyu band karo log badi khushi se usko mana rahe hain लोग मंदिर में जाते हैं गुरुद्वारे में जाते हैं चर्च में जाते हैं मस्जिद में जाते हैं खुश होते हैं मन शांत होता है और उस हालत में आप भजन अभ्यास भी अच्छा कर सकते हो वेन यू आर फॉलोइंग सर्टेन ट्रेडिशन ऑफ रिलीजन इन द होल फैमिली कंटिन्यू टू फॉलो दैट इज नो इंटरफियरेंस with doing those things and meditating with him if you stop all those things the whole family will be after you ki what are you doing where are you leaving you can't even meditate therefore continue to do those things but only know the truth will not be found outside there are rituals and ceremonies done to keep peace around you especially peace in the house so therefore continue to do them but practice your meditation to get the truth inside don't have to stop anything you don't have to change your religion don't have to change the rituals and ceremonies of your religion you can follow whatever you doing but the truth will be always inside you and you can do this meditation it is not religion this is pure spirituality and the origin of all religions was pure spirituality and therefore when you combine the rituals which are external with the true spirituality you will get benefit of both therefore you need not stop anything i want to tell you little story my father was married to a woman whose mother had a beautiful temple in her house and she had all the images of all the gods and goddesses and it was a temple in the house and she used to worship all those gods and goddesses she did aarti she had incense beautiful sandalwood incense she had candles burning and she had little lamps burning in the temple and she worshiped all the gods and goddesses my father got initiated from this great master and went to his mother in law and said why are you doing all these things they are all external they don't give you anything she rebuked him don't talk like that about my gods and goddesses they are real whatever i wish for i can get from these gods and goddesses don't ridicule them he said no 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 i found out the real gods and goddesses are inside you not outside he said i have never seen inside you go and see inside i have my gods and goddesses right in front of me in my temple in my house my father went to great master he said i love my mother in law i want her to understand what you are teaching me is the good real thing and she is following blindly those little pieces of stone and steel and calling them gods and goddesses great master said don't worry i will come and talk to her he visited the house of my nani ji my grandmother my mother's mother and she called their 
He said, I understand you have a temple. The great master said, ah, yes, I have a temple. Can I also go there? Most welcome. He went there. He said, bowed to all those gods and goddesses. And he did arti. Took the bell in his hand and began to ring the bell. And my grandmother was so happy. She did arti with him for those gods and goddesses. And she looked at my father. Now you see, you didn't know anything. Your master knows the real thing. He is doing the arti prayer with me of those gods and goddesses. And the master was very happy. Baba Savan Singh, sitting there, worshipping those gods and goddesses. He left. My grandmother was very happy. That's your guru himself accepts these gods and goddesses and did arti with me. You guys never understood your own guru. She rebuked my father. She said, I want to go and meet the Guru again. And she came to attend his discourses. She attended one discourse, two discourses. She said, he is really, he knows the truth. That's why he came to my house. She went to him, please initiate me. She got initiated. She began to do meditation. She was so happy see, seeing the Guru inside when she is meditating, she forgot all about those gods and goddesses. After six, seven months, she asked for personal time interview with great master. She said, Master, I am doing my meditation and I am very happy with what I am getting. I am a little concerned that there is my temple in the house with all those murtis gods and goddesses, what shall I do with them? He said, do you have a gunny bag, some big brown bag, in which you bring your flower, atta? She said, I have. Have you old one? Yes. Go and put them all in that bag. Tie up the bag and confine them to the river when you get a chance. She went back, packed up all those murtis and tied them up and with the prayer of the Simran, threw them into the river. How did that happen? How did this great master go and turn that lady's mind all around? He did it by first becoming her friend, then master. First identifying with her, then becoming, telling something else. Swami Brahmanand, he first saluted him, then he was his follower forever. He went to a Sikh Gurdwara once, in Rawalpindi, which used to be called Rawalpindi now, a part of it is called Islamabad, capital of Pakistan. and. Some of the Sikhs of the Akalis and others, Singh Sabha, they said, how dare a man come and claim he is a Guru? According to our religion, Guru Granth Sahib is the only Guru. And we in our Ardas, in our prayer, always say that the Panth has been started and after henceforth, Guru Manyo Granth you have to accept the Granth as your Guru. And this man claims to be a Guru. We will kill him with our own swords. A man who is who's bringing ridicule to our own religion. This news was brought to Great Master's notice. That they plan to assassinate you. We should cancel the program. The secretary said, and go back to the Dera. We are just sitting here in Rawal Pindi going to give you a satsang in a big hall they have reserved for you. There is going to be massacre here. He said, no, no, I will not change my program. My satsang will start at 10 o'clock in the same place. 
I was also there in that party, by the way, and everybody was scared. What battle we will see tomorrow? In the morning, he got up early. He says, "Let's go to the Gurudwara," and we went to the Gurudwara. And all those people with their swords also followed. He took out five rupees, offered to the Guru Granth Sahib, and put his head down and bowed to the Guru Granth Sahib. To the amazement of all those people, and said to the chanter Patti who was with him, "Go and instead of the man who's sitting on the Granth Sahib now." You go and read. Read the two, three shabds of the fifth Guru Guru Arjan Dev. And he went, and he just pushed the man aside, and he was also with blue turban. He was also with a long beard. He was a full Sikh. He had a kada in his arm. Everybody accepted him, and he read there. He read from Guru Arjan Dev's sayings that unless you can see the face of a master, you get no mukti. And if you have a darshan of a living master, and these are in the in the Granth Sahib, I am telling you what he was reading. Your account is settled. And he found his people. He said. There were ten gurus, only ten. In the whole Granth Sahib, only one guru has compiled the teachings of five gurus. The four, five came later. The Guru Granth Sahib contains the teachings of five gurus up to Guru Arjan Dev, who compiled the whole Granth. When the Granth was read, that is man, one of the famous part of it. Which I love so much. Many of you sing when I go there, especially if you go to Gurudwara. Jo mange Thakur apne the, soi soi dele. That is only the beginning. Whatever you want from your Lord, He will give you. What does the Lord do? Being powerful enough over the nine worlds, He can place His hand. Head on your head and give you a blessing. Can't live. How gun? How gun? Sub mete. If he gives you hug, he can remove your vices and cut your karma. Three shabds were read, showing how the gurus have praised their living guru, and all ten gurus had living masters, living gurus. We talking of the Guru Granth. A man came to me in Vancouver the other day. He said, "You should tell people that the Guru Granth Sahib is the Guru." I said, "I tell them, but you should follow the Guru, not read him. You should do what the Guru is saying. He is saying the same things. Granth Sahib is saying the same things. I rely entirely on Granth Sahib, and I can tell you the same things I am saying. No difference." The man met me. He said, "Then why does the Granth Sahib say that you should follow the Granth?" I said, "Have you read the Granth Sahib? You haven't read it. I have. I have read the whole of it more than three times." I said, "You have never read it because you are saying something which is not in the Granth. You are saying Granth Sahib is saying follow the Granth. Show me where it is written." No master has ever said. No Sikh guru has ever said that. How did this phrase come about? Study history. Study the history of Sikh literature, including the Granth Sahib. Study that it was one Pai who was reading the Ardas, who put this word there, much after the tenth guru had passed away. Only it was made part of an Ardas of a prayer by somebody, and people are mistaken thinking. It's part of the Granth Sahib, the true teachings of the Gurus. Read Granth Sahib and then talk about Granth Sahib. They don't do it. People talk to me, 
Sikhs talk to me. They say, you are talking beyond what Granth Sahib says. I say, show me where is one word of mine which is not in the Granth Sahib. Show me anything that is not there. But don't begin to say things that outside of the Granth Sahib and make them part of Granth Sahib. My master, Baba Sawan Singh was a Sikh. And he followed Sikh tradition. He wore the kada. He wore a turban. He had long hair. He didn't leave the traditions, but he went inside and found the truth, which was being explained by his own guru was also a Sikh. So we have not to give up our religion, our religious traditions, just because we think they are, the, they are giving us truth. Follow what the religious traditions, original, original guru's words say, follow them, no matter what religion. And they will all say the truth is inside you, not outside. If you want to have a real deal, and I had a real deal with my master when I heard those words, which are from Gansa. In Punjabi, Gurbuki it says, Kaya Nagar, Nagar hai Niko, which is Sodha Harras Kije. Translated, this body is a city. And there's a place where transactional business is going on. If you want a true divine transaction, go into that market which is inside. This is the market inside. Want to have real deal? Go there. I, I can explain from any text of any religion. The founders have said the same thing. Truth has to be found inside, not outside. Real Gurdwara is this body. And this little place is the Gurdwara, the upper part of Gurdwara where you can do your meditation. This is the temple. This is the real mandir where you can go and ring inner bells which you don't even have, have to hold in your hands. They ring by themselves. This is the real church in which the real bells toll, not from a belfry, but from your own self inside. This body is everything which they are describing. They are making Buddhist temples, the stupas were made, domes were made, in which you could find truth. They were symbols outside for the real dome we are all carrying on our head. And imagine the single message of all founders of all religions that go inside and find the truth is being so misinterpreted that we think we are divided. Our gods are different. All others are fake. All they are saying the same thing, they are fake. Just because we are following one set of traditions. I live in America and I meet my Christian friends. I said, let's go to this church. We'll hear some good sermon. Because one of the sermons in the Christian Bible is by St. John, John's Gospel, opening sentences of that Gospel are, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and nothing was made that was not made by Him. The opening sentence. Rig Veda of the Hindus says, in the beginning was a nod, a sound. Everything has come into being because of that sound. Nothing has come in which was not the sound. This is Sanskrit translation of John Gospel. But the Sanskrit was first, John Gospel. John Gospel came later. Who translated, who we don't know, but both are true. In the beginning is the Shabd, our ultimate consciousness which can be audible when we are in the physical body. That's a creative power, it's not sound. But it can be heard when we are in the physical body. And what can be heard can be called Shabd, can be called Word, can be called Kalma, it can be called anything. Therefore, we should not fight about religions, carry on your traditions. But never forget, every religion is telling us, this is the real temple, this is the real church, this is the real Gurdwara. 
this is the real synagogue go with them and worship there you will find it thank you very much for listening to me attentively